with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rita Graff, the director of our tech prep group. Thank you, Rita. Hi, and good morning, everyone. I'm so glad everybody's <clears throat> able to meet us today, meet with us today. I'm Rita Graff, the Chief Administrator of the Tech Prep Southwest Regional Service Center. And with Tech Prep, um, I work with secondary, me and my team, actually I have a team, and we all work with secondary and post-secondary education. We work with our community, we work with our business partners and our employers to increase and support the student access. Whether that means as a student, you go straight into the workforce use, you know, with access to a pre-apprenticeship or an apprenticeship, or you go into a college um, and with credits that you've awarded that you that you received while you're in high school. This event is actually a perfect example of all those partners coming together. I'm glad you are here to take part in this critical conversation. And several groups of regional healthcare professionals are going to be here. <clears throat> and all, all these professionals are interested in helping you land your first healthcare job. So this is exciting. Um, I do want to let everybody know we are recording this event. I know that we do have everyone muted and we also have the cameras off, but we also want to encourage you to use the chat option. The chat functions there. These sessions are, are going to be open for discussion, so feel free to use that chat. We will be monitoring that chat throughout the whole event. With this all said, I'm not going to take up much any more time. I do want to introduce you to somebody that's been a huge part in gathering everybody into this um, for this event, all these healthcare professionals all together in one place, especially for your students, in order to help you better um, know what's going on out in the healthcare uh, world. So Hope Arthur is the director of the Workforce Innovation with the Health Collaborative. Hope. Thank you, Rita. And thanks to everyone for joining us here today. We have a fabulous group of education and healthcare professionals presenting to you, and all are interested in helping the students that are here identify and land their first healthcare career. I want to give you just a pre uh, preview of what we'll be doing. First, you're going to meet several individuals who are currently working in healthcare hear about how they got their start and how they progressed their career to where they are now and what a day in their work life really looks like. Next, you'll hear from several human resource professionals who will help you get a better understanding of the employment application, what they're looking for, what each question really means, how to complete it, and even share some great do's and don'ts to keep in mind during the application process. And then we'll conclude with several talent acquisition professionals. These are the folks you actually talk to during the interviewing process. And they'll share examples of their favorite interviews and some of the best questions they like to ask and what they're really looking for when they ask those questions. And um, as importantly, how you might wanna consider forming your answers to such questions as you prep for your interviews. Throughout the sessions, as Rita said, we really want you to interact through the chat, share your questions. This event is for you. Let us know what you wanna hear from the panelists too, and we'll keep an eye on that to make sure that we get your questions answered. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to the moderators for our first panel. These are two amazing ladies I have the pleasure to work with and they are dedicated and work each and every day to create opportunities for students like yourselves to experience and connect to the vast employment opportunities available in healthcare. They advocate for you. They work tirelessly on your behalf and they remember to make working together really fun. So please join me in welcoming Helen McKinney, Helena McKinney, Workforce Manager for the Health Collaborative, and Katie Bauer, Strategic Partnership Coordinator for Lakota Local Schools. Ladies. Thank you, Hope. Good morning. How are you all doing today? You can't respond, but I'll just say that anyway. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> um, I am Katie Bauer, and my partner in crime is Helena and in my little Brady Bunch squares, she's that way over there. Um, but Helena and I are going to welcome our panelists. 
and we would love for them all to introduce themselves. So maybe Wendy, would you like to get us started? Hi, I'm Wendy Howe. I'm the lead medical assistant for Mercy Dry Ridge Family Medicine. Awesome. And Brianna? Hi, I'm Brianna. Um, I am the HR generalist at Maple Knoll Community. Excellent. And Dr. Bricking. Good morning, and thank you for having me today. Uh, my name is Keith Bricking, and I am an emergency medicine physician and currently the chief uh, executive officer of Atrium Medical Center, uh, 300 bed hospital here in Middletown. Excellent. All right. So, as Hope kind of shared with everyone, this morning our first panel is going to really kind of talk about those interesting journeys that we all take to get to the career that we've found because um, at least myself and our panelists, we've not gone the, the direct route. You know, it wasn't like uh, kindergarten straight to medical school. So um, Brianna, why don't you kick us off and kind of share a little bit about your healthcare journey and if you started with this kind of position in mind and if not, how that went for you. Okay, so my career path or I really wanted to go to school to be an accountant. Um, I actually was working as a fast food restaurant and I came across um, one of our employees that currently work at Maple No in our security department and she was just telling us about jobs that she had open and I'm like, you know what, I'm tired of working at fast food, time to do something different. Um, so I actually started my career, or I should say my path here at Maple Knoll Communities um, as a security officer. Um, I felt like that was like my foot in the door. I did not know what I was doing, um, but with the proper training, you know, I started getting very well acquainted with that. Um, I did get a business degree, so I started to then work in our um, business office um, in our account of finance department. So that was my path. So first it was security, just get my foot in the door, um, and then working again in our account of finance department. Um, eventually, there was an HR position that came open. And again, I didn't know anything about HR, how it goes, anything like that. Um, but my supervisor, the VP of HR was like, you got this, like you can do it. So that kind of is where I got to where I am today. Um, yeah, that's my path. That's my story. Um, it did not go straight, narrow. No, it did not. I had so many curves and obstacles, but again, this is where I am now and I enjoy it. That is so cool. So I'm sure in your many different variety of positions, okay. especially at Maple Knoll, you all serve in, a, in a diff lots of different capacities with right. healthcare services. Yes. What kind of... Um, do you see in others what you had that kind of drive to just see what's coming next and what's cool? Like, how do you see that in people or how do they portray those positive qualities in your organ? I think just being open, um, trying new things. Um, I don't know. I think that's really what it is. It's just being able to adventure um, and not being the normal. Um, and again, just trying new things. I think that's kind of what drove me and the curiosity. Um, and of course, having like others around me that's saying like, you can do it, you can do it. I think that's really what encouraged me and drove me to do what I did. So I think that's what that's it is. Awesome. <laughs> All right, Keith, what about you? Kind of tell us maybe where you got started and how you landed where you currently are. Sure, thank you. Uh, I have certainly had an interesting path uh, over my 30 plus years. Um, in high school, like similar to other high schoolers, I was, you know, just looking for a job, worked in a grocery store, you know, cut grass. Um, uh, when I was in high school, I actually had the opportunity to, to volunteer in a hospital and volunteer at an assisted living environment. And I started to realize, you know, I really like being around people and I kind of like science and, and, and uh, in college uh, early on, I actually got a job as a transporter on the overnight shift at uh, one of the local hospitals in Northern Kentucky. And from there, I was exposed to all aspects of the hospital, the emergency department, the lab, certainly nursing units. Uh, and I realized, you know, I really could see myself being in an environment where I work in a hospital. 
Uh, still wasn't convinced and in, in, in college uh, at Northern Kentucky University. Fortunately, I had several great professors who recommended, you know, you should, you should reach out to physicians and uh, maybe shatter them, reach out to nurses, find out what their careers are like. Uh, I had an aunt that worked in a lab and drew blood for a living. And so I really just tried to expose myself to different areas within, within uh, patient care. Uh, from there, I decided to go down this path of medical school uh, and certainly spent the next, after college, four years in medical school and then three years in residency uh, focusing on emergency medicine. Uh, around that time, I, I came back to the kind of the south, Southwest Ohio area and really was just practicing in the emergency department. Absolutely loved it. Uh, the, the great thing about the emergency department, and I say this all the time, you become the jack of all trades. You have to be ready to see anything that comes in, in the door. Um, over the next you know, five to seven years, I, I became very intrigued by how the hospital and how the emergency department works. Uh, you know, in order to be able to deliver care, there's multiple moving parts that have to really work in concert together, whether it's imaging, whether it's lab, whether it's registration, whether it's the billing people, whether it's the clinicians, the nurse, the, the, the physician, the respiratory therapist. And I started to, to, to learn a little bit more about operations of a hospital and actually went back to school again uh, for, for, for a master's in business administration. And it took me down this path uh, that I currently am, am, am down and have been for the last several years of actually being involved in running a hospital. And certainly now as president, um, I, I do that on a daily basis. I do still practice clinically in the emergency department. Um, had a shift uh, earlier this, uh, this week. Absolutely love taking care of patients, but just love the hospital and clinical environment. That's so interesting because as you mentioned, you went and you kind of dabbled in lots of different areas to really find exactly what you want. It's almost like going to the buffet, right? If you don't try all the different dishes, right. you don't know which one's your favorite. So that is so important for our students to hear because I think oftentimes, um, you know, we can always be apprehensive to try new things, but if you're not willing to just at least go in and check it out and see what it's about, uh, you might not know that it might be your favorite. So that's awesome. Thank you very much. All right, Wendy, last but not least, what about you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? So like Brianna, when I graduated high school 31 years ago, I thought I wanted to be an accountant. <laughs> I took all the courses all through high school and I, I thought that's what I was gonna do. And the summer after I graduated, I took a algebra course at Cincinnati State. And not long after that, I had a friend of mine, her mom was an RN in a, in a internist and cardiology office, and they needed somebody to do billing. So I went into this office, not knowing much about the medical field at all. Um, barely had we called the doctor much as kids. So um, when I got in there, flu season was rounding about about six months later, and they told us everybody needed to learn each other's jobs in case we needed to cover. So next thing you know, I'm giving shots and drawing blood and grooming patients, doing EKGs, all the things I never thought I would do. And now all these years later, I've been with Mercy now 22 years and have worked up to a lead position um, where I do a lot of training with the staff, um, externships. Um, I still room cover wherever I need to. I'm like that go-to person. I've even learned how to do IT through the COVID. <laughs> so virtual world has become real to us. That is so cool. And it's, it's so interesting when you have an idea of what you think you might want, and then it's, <laughs> that's not it, or it has a way of telling you that that's, that's not it, and then you have other callings coming. That's awesome. Helena, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thanks, Katie. Um, so our next question for all of you is about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. In your position, what are the basic daily responsibilities you have? And also, if you can kind of share what skills or characteristics you feel that people listening today might need to be successful in your job or jobs that you work with. So we can go ahead and start again with you, Brianna. Okay. Um, so my day-to-day 
Oh, it's different, honestly. Um, so I am, I get employees started. So I get them through, or I should say, I reach out to candidates to do a, to do interviews. Um, I get them through the process. I'm a part of the high end process as well. Um, so I get them through, I handle HR issues. Um, that is a lot. It's just a lot of HR duties. I can't really like pinpoint exactly what I do, um, but it's just a lot of like onboarding process, reaching out to employees, um, just to, again, just to get them through the process. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second question? What? What kind of things do you feel, um, or like what characteristics do you feel you need to be successful in your job or to kind of thrive in your job and what you do? Oh, in my job, I feel like we have to have empathy for our employees. Um, I've learned that honestly through COVID um, with our employees needing to take off, um, them needing to take care of our residents. I've learned that we really have empathy. We need to have empathy for our employees. That is very important. Um, another key characteristic is team players. Um, personally, as I should say for myself, um, again, I do work in HR, um, but during COVID, I was working as a temporary nurse aide, so I was working as an STNA as well. Um, so I've actually learned how to help take care of the residents. Um, that was not my job at all, but you know what? I rolled my sleeves up, put some scrubs on, and it was all about our residents. Um, so I think team player or being a team player is a very important part of you know the job or positions, so yeah. Those are a few things, few important things to me anyways. <laughs> Helena, you're muted, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sorry about that. Do you wanna go next, Dr. Working? Sure. Thanks. Uh, you know, my day-to-day -day looks very different. Um, some days I'm, you know, in my office or I'm convening in meetings, you know, six or eight hours, 10 hours a day, and there's other days where I'm out and about my, my primary responsibility is at the hospital uh, as, as, the, as the president is uh, certainly to oversee the, the quality and the patient experience uh, of the individuals that, that come through our doors to seek care. Uh, and I think we do a great job at that. Uh, some of the things that I enjoy in my day to day is really sitting down with our teams, our leadership teams and our frontline employees, just to get a sense of what's going on in the front line, what's going on what are some of, the, some of the obstacles and some of the challenges that they're facing in their job? And what can I do as a leader to help them overcome those challenges? Uh, I certainly enjoy working with physicians to collaborate on what type of care can be provided or what type of new technologies can be provided, certainly at the hospital or within the region. Uh, we do a lot of collaboration with our sister hospitals within our organization, as well as with other hospitals in the region. Um, and then we do a lot of community outreach. So today happens to be a meeting where I've got four or five meetings with community partners uh, talking about how we can, again, improve the health of the community, work with uh, other leaders in, 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 uh, in that space. So it kind of makes it exciting. Uh, certainly, say, for example, on Monday when I worked an ER shift, you, know, you show up at the hospital and you, you take care of the, the patients that come into the door. Um, and, uh, and that's certainly a different day in the life that I have uh, compared to when I have to show up in a, in a shirt and tie and, and uh, administrate, but I uh, certainly enjoy it. You know, as far as um, strengths or, or, or uh, some of the things that I think are important is I think it's always important to be a good listener. So the only way that you're gonna learn about other people's perspectives and these other jobs that are out there in healthcare is if you seek to understand, there are so many opportunities in healthcare that really are not even patient facing. If you like accounting or you like math, maybe it's within the, the revenue cycle or the billing or the accounting area. If you like information technology, you know the future of healthcare is certainly gonna be a much more virtual IT based uh, platform. Everything is on the, the, the electronic medical record. There's a lot of opportunities in healthcare uh, with, with an IT and then of course you have uh, patient care. And I think it's important to, to always listen and then always be, be comfortable asking questions. Uh, I think another thing that has allowed me to be successful over the last 20 plus years has been finding mentors and finding other people uh, that I can, I can learn from. 
and it may be in the clinical space, it may not may be in a non-clinical space. But I think as you're going through high school and you're going through college, it's important to connect with you know, professors or leaders in the community or professionals, aunts, uncles, parents that, that are connected to uh, uh, clinicians or people that are doing their job just to get a, get a, get a sense of, of, of their path and lean on them for knowledge and soak that up. And it sounds so interesting that there's something you mentioned when you were talking about how almost like every day is very different. Um, and you have to collaborate and work together to find the best treatment plans for your patients. So it's almost using creativity, um, which is, you wouldn't necessarily think of medicine as a creative job or career, but it really is. It's thinking kind of outside the box to find solutions. But I think that one thing that's so important for our students to understand is that there are some jobs that are the same every day. And then there are jobs that are not. And it sounds like from at least from both of you so far that, and especially how Wendy, you mentioned like when you're, you know, you're kind of rolling in, rolling up your sleeves and getting in the weeds that medicine is really not a, every day is the same kind of a career in most instances. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yeah, I, th I think it's constantly evolving and, and you've got to be able to think creatively. We, we have a meeting at once a week and the first 15 minutes of that meeting, we focus on innovation and creativity. What are the things that we're going to do different in the next week? What are the things that we're going to look at in a different lens, through a different lens to, again, get our minds kind of thinking you know, outside of the, the, the black and white box that we, that we typically live in. You know, we're, uh, the, the goal is to take great care of patients, but there's multiple ways to do that. And in collaboration, teamwork uh, and partnership is certainly the way. How about you, Wendy? What's your day kind of like? <laughs> like Keith, it's never the same two days in a row. As a lead, you know, I could potentially walk in. We have five physicians and our, our providers in our office. And I have eight MAs and four front office and a manager. There, it's always something different going on. But our main goal, like he says, is the patient. You know, I could potentially be rooming patients for the day, drawing blood for the day, um, giving shots. Um, a lot of it seems to be like messaging, like calling people back on timely, like making sure they get their results, making sure they get their refills taken care of. A lot of behind the scenes stuff that people don't realize that happens on a daily basis. When you call in your doctor's office, you think, okay, I'm gonna get a call back. Sometimes, you know, there's a lot going on here. Some days we may have that person that walks in with chest pain and we could potentially be focusing on that um, could be walking, walking into a room that somebody's suicidal that day. Our days, we go with the flow. We have to prioritize what's most important that day. Be flexible. We're a team. We all help each other. No, no man goes alone. So if some, one person is down, we all like jump in and help. Especially through COVID, we realized that how much we needed each other. You know, we now went into this virtual world that we were not familiar with. You know, I'm the oldest of the MA, so it was like, wow, what do we do here? But I made sure that in my day that I learned as much as I could about it so I could help the next person. So, and you know, that's kind of how our day goes for everything. You know, I do a lot of education for staffing, for future MAs that come up. I, I even help in the front office. Somebody off or sick, I go up, I answer phones, I <laughs> register them. I do whatever is required just to make things flow so that patients don't know what's behind the scenes that's not going well. So, because nothing's perfect in it. We see anywhere from newborn babies all the way up to the elderly. So we have a wide range. We see multiple generations of families you know, we could see great grandma and see the new infant that's in their family. So, you know, we're really connected. We treat them like they're one of our family members. And we tell them all the time, I spend more time with you sometimes than I do my own family. And that's why I love coming back to work every day. This is probably my favorite job of all time. So.
So I don't, I can't imagine doing anything other than what I do today. Um, th- this means more than anything. So, but it, it could be high stress some days, but some days it's not. So, but being able to be flexible is the most important part of the, this job. So being able to do different things and a drop of that. So Keith will probably tell you too, like in the ER, you don't know what's walking in your door that day. You don't know what's happened to that person before they got here. That's so interesting because, and you know, it's important that we all understand that learning never stops, right? Because if, <laughs> no. <laughs> if you're intaking student or patients on one day and drawing blood the next, you can't forget how to do one or the other. And you have to have that continuous learning. Would all of you briefly mind kind of talking about what if there's, is there, what does that learning look like in, internally for you all? Is there a formal structure to those um, educational supplements or that ongoing professional development? Or is it more like, you know, staff member to staff member? How do you keep fresh and sharp? Like I, it, you know, thinking Keith, you're, you're running like an entire hospital and you're also practicing medicine. How do you have time to keep up with all that knowledge? Or is it kind of built into your day to day? What, can you talk to us a little bit about what that continuous learning looks like? I think it's probably a little bit of all of the above. Uh, certainly, there's still some um, more structured education. You know, as a physician, similar to other other responsibilities, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a radiology tech, whether you're a respiratory therapist, there's continuing education that you have to, to to do in order to maintain your license or certification. The great thing about the the, the continuing education is it can be in print form, so you can read and take questions, like answer questions. You could do virtual events or, uh, and, and, and listen to, uh, to, to videos or podcasts. Uh, you could you know, read or participate in conferences. I think that th- those things are all great. Uh, I think that true learning though and the true professional and personal development is, is engaging other people on a regular basis around solutions, around problems and getting the solutions. Uh, there, there's always gonna be some fundamental skills that you're going to have to acquire through a technical school or through a class, um, but but as you get out into the real world, you've got to be able to leverage those skills into the real world. And and you 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 learn so much from your peers, your mentors, your leaders, your supervisors, your managers. And I think again, it's about soaking those things up. But you always have to be a continuous learner. Uh, you know, none of us would be in our positions now if we didn't constantly have that thirst to learn more and do better. And the reason why we're doing better, again, goes back to why we're doing it, to, to, to take care of patients, to take care of our community. So as long as you have that, that thirst for learning more, uh, it certainly makes it a lot easier to, you know, to go through the continuing more formal education. But I think a lot of it really is informal. Brianna or Wendy, anything to add there on how you all kind of keep each other sharp on your skills? You want to go first, Brianna? Sure. Um, just to piggyback off, the, off Dr. Brecken a little bit, um, honestly, like you said, a lot of your training comes from um, like comes from working with others and just like a lot of on the job training. Like, of course, I went to seminars because, again, I didn't know anything about HR prior to starting my position. Um, so I went to seminars when we had those before COVID. Um, but again, a lot of my, um, a lot of my training came from working with others, like working with my supervisors and other HR leaders. So that's where a lot of my experience came from. In my situation, Mercy, um, always, um, provides yearly training for us. We do a lot of virtual videos to keep up to date. Um, But we do a lot of um, competencies once a year where we go and prove that we can still do that skill. Um, Through the years of, because I didn't go to school for this, I learned mostly from my providers. You know, I paid attention, I improved. If I did something wrong, I made sure that I corrected that quickly um, so that the next time, I would be better at it. And most of my training, that's how I did it. Only four years ago did I finally 
take the MA test um, because it was required as part of our job that we now had to be certified. I'd gone all these years and certification wasn't necessary. I went and I got the highest score out of the whole group. So even with no schooling, everybody else had done schooling. I got a 97% on that test and it was over 200 questions. And I was able to help train other nurses that were getting ready to go through the same test to prepare them. So I, I hosted a group training where MAs from other offices could come in and learn from what I experienced so that they could do better. And they all went and passed their test as well. So, but every day is training in an office. So it, no two days will be the same, but really paying attention to what the providers are saying to us, it makes a big difference. You know, it could make difference on that next phone call that where somebody says, hey, I have neck pain and my arm, you know, if you're paying attention enough, you know that could be a potential for a cardiac issue. Um, and it makes you more aware that, hey, this is urgent. We need to get you in sooner. Or if they are having stroke symptoms. So I, I really give dibs, like he said, that you learn on the job, really paying attention and being able to make change. Because um, it's, it's never, it's always evolving. Uh, medical fields 31 years ago, we had paper charts. Now we're all online. You know, everything about it has been different, except for drawing blood. You still draw the same as you used to. So that is like a bike. You never forget. <laughs> well, and we do have a couple of questions in the chat. So um, we have one that says, did you guys ever worry about the schooling or education you needed time or money wise? Was that ever a concern or what maybe were some resources? Like it's like, Wendy, you just said you hosted kind of a study group to help your yeah. peers um, get ready. I would assume that was free, maybe a cup of coffee or something. What other, um, what other resources are out there, if you know of any, that um, kind of could help ease the mind of our students that might be headed down one of these paths? Well, that was one of the reasons I didn't become an accountant because, you know, I had a middle-class family. It really wasn't in the budget. I paid for that one course on my own. But um, luckily with then companies like Mercy, they actually help um, get you there. So um, they are now like hosting like for MAs and supporting them and doing some um, education for them. So like if you start out in the front office doing registration, you could potentially advance into the MA through one of their programs. So there, there's always an opportunity. It's just finding it. Sometimes, you know, asking, you know, you just a quick hit up on Facebook, asking somebody, do they know of anything? You know, it, it's surprising what we know. Like we, we do that with medications, like the people that can't afford their medications. Guess what? We know how to help you get that medication. Same idea with your education. There are ways. It's just finding the right person to help you to get there. And a lot of jobs, like here at Maple Know, we do offer tuition reimbursement. So that's also good to know as well. So you know that while you're going to school, you can also get refunded for that once you know you keep your grades good. So that's also um, a plus as well. Um, also here at Maple Know, we do hire STNAs, um, which is state, state test in their states. Um, so once you go through the program, um, your employer is required to pay you back for taking those courses. So again, you pay up front and it's good to know that you are going to get that money back. Um, so again, it may be hard trying to come up with the money in the beginning, but it is good to know at least you will get your money back um, once you've graduated and passed the course. So that's good to know. I think the key, the key of, I'm sorry, Kitty. No, go ahead. I, I think the key of what you're hearing is you need to tap into your resources. There are a lot of resources out there. You know, there's a lot of great community colleges. There's a lot of great technical schools. There's a lot of great classes in high school and an early college. You know, there's a lot of high school students now that are coming out as a sophomore or junior in college because they have college credits. And, and that saves them a whole year's tuition. Uh, I think it, as, as, as Brianna and Wendy said, there are a lot of employers out there that are willing to help. Uh, I also think there's a lot of scholarships out there. I uh, also came from a middle class family. I lived at home from college. You're going to have to make some decisions on what's most important. 
when you're paying for your own college, if there's an opportunity to live at home a little bit longer, your parents may not like that. They may like that. I don't know. But but you know you tap into those resources, and then there is cer certainly financial aid out there. I think it's going to be important though, as you take on that financial aid, to just be responsible. Uh, I you know again I borrowed a little bit of money for 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 undergrad, and fortunately was able to work full time during undergrad. And then I did borrow money through medical school because I didn't have a job. Uh, but again, tap into your resources, lean on your, your counselors, lean on the HR department, because there's often scholarship opportunities, education opportunities, credits that you can take advantage of. And to piggy off that, um, piggyback off that question, I was sent a, a question about, are there formal groups to access mentors in the medical field? Uh, or if not, how is the, where's the best place to get started with those connections, right? To shadow or to tap into those professionals that are willing to help. Where should kids go, I guess, to start that conversation? Mercy does do job shadowing. Um, we've had some high school students come in and over the years, um, but some of them were patients that just showed interest and we reached out to HR you know, there's some confidentiality things that have to be dealt with, but absolutely, you know, we want to encourage it as much as possible. So Mercy is very good at um, allowing um, externs to come in um, as well as job shadows. Um, I, we, Dr. One of our providers here um, is uh, trains residents and students uh, for the colleges. So like they come in here, they can job shadow with him before even considering going to medical school. So, and he's done that as long as we've been together here for the last 22 years. So he took his education and is now sharing it with others as well. But he's had multiple students come in right after high school to see if this is really the path they wanna take at some point. Great. We yeah, have- Oh, keep going, keep going. Oh, sorry, Katie. I, just, I, I, think, I think you will find that the vast majority of hospitals and hospital systems provide opportunities to connect with employees and leaders in a shadowing or a volunteering opportunity. Uh, I think what, wherever you guys live in proximity, I would contact the HR department at the local hospital and see if there's a, an opportunity to volunteer uh, and that gives you great exposure or if they have a job shadowing program within within the hospitals. I think the other thing is, you know, often teachers, uh, parents, aunts and uncles know somebody that knows somebody that works in a healthcare setting. And often they can they can also bring people into their place of employment for a day or two or they have a program. So just ask questions, connect with connect with you, with your teachers, connect with your with with the. Uh, uh, the local resources. There's there's plenty of opportunity to to engage. All right, we are, have, we have about five minutes left, and we've got two questions that I would love to get answered from the chat. Um, firstly, the question is: Do you feel that the healthcare setting offers safe employment opportunities for minorities such as LGBTQ or other ethnically diverse groups? Absolutely. Um, we see a lot of Nepali patients and we don't speak Nepali. Um, we've actually um, hired um, a young lady for quite a while that spoke Nepali, was able to help translate for us. You know, we don't use that as our main resource, um, but like in the rooming process, when you're checking somebody's blood pressure, just to explain to them, we just need to put the cuff on your arm. You know, sometimes she was able to relate that easy enough, but a lot of times we pull in a translator, but you're, this is a flexible environment. You know, there's room for everyone. It doesn't matter what your background is. Awesome. Well, you, I, I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, was gonna, I didn't know if Brianna had something I was gonna chime in and add. No, add go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, I think another important thing, the answer is yes. I think that there's certainly uh, a welcoming environment within the healthcare uh, uh, community for, for, for employment uh, and, uh, and actually providing care for, for you know, a diverse population. I think it's a fair question when you meet with HR, maybe Brianna would feel differently, is to ask about their diversity and inclusion program. Are they, are they is the employer intentional 
about making sure that it's an inclusive environment? What type of training and education goes on at that location or within that community or within that healthcare setting on making sure you're educated on the uh, LGBT community? Uh, are there other employees that they can tap into to, to validate that it is a welcoming environment or a safe environment for, for them to practice, for them to work in? So I, I think those are fair questions to ask HR. Uh, and, if, and if the employer does have those programs, if they truly believe that, uh, then you will, you will certainly hear that in your interview. I agree. Um, we actually just created a diversity and inclusion um, group um, just because we wanted to make sure that we were including everyone. Um, our, um, at Maple Knoll, we are a very diverse, we have so many different employees from many different backgrounds. So it's honestly, um, like you said, a fair question. I do feel like we do make sure, again, we include our employees, we include everybody, no matter your background. Um, we wanna make sure that you feel just as important because you are. Um, and it's nice to see that around our residents, um, to see the different backgrounds that we have here. So that is important. Excellent. Yes. And I think our last question and so good to wrap up with, how mm -hmm. do you all balance work and life, especially with family? How do you make it all balance? <laughs> with, you're all so passionate about your career. How do you, make, you know, fit it all in in your life? Well, I raised a 17 year old through working <laughs> full time. <laughs> Some days you didn't get out when you thought you would. I made sure I got the daycare next door <laughs> so I could go last minute. You know, you, you do what you have to do every day. It's just like any other job. Um, you, you find flexibility. Uh, luckily, if you're truly a team at your job, there's coverage between each other. If we have to go to a doctor's appointment, somebody covers you while you're gone, you know, it, it works out. If you have a sick kid, they know, you know, Hey, I gotcha. Go ahead. You know, just like any other job, if you work well as a team together, it works itself. I am still personally still trying to work and find that work-life balance. It is a struggle, but I am working on it. Um, but I agree with um, Wendy. Um, it is something Flexibil flexibility, um, and like you said, having covered some others. Like yesterday, I had to leave early because my daughter had cheerleading fittings. Like, so it's that flexibility of working with others so that way I can maintain that balance with trying to be a mom and trying to make sure I maintain a job. So I'm still working on it though. It doesn't <laughs> happen overnight. <laughs> I would just echo uh, uh, your comments. I think it's a constant um, thing to work on. I, I have four teenage children. I have a very understanding wife that has been with me for almost 25 years and, and, and certainly helps to have a support structure uh, at home that, that uh, uh, really encourages you to, to be at your best. Uh, I think the key is being intentional. You know, when you go home, uh, put down the phone. When you are going to have date night, have date night. When you are going to set aside you know, hours on the weekend to, to, to be at your children's events, you need to do that. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, I'm far from it, but I think you have to be intentional about it in order to, to make it a priority. Otherwise, your other passions, your life, your, your excuse me, your work, um, you know, especially if you love what you do, it can consume you and it, it shouldn't consume you. You've got to have that balance. So I think that's a great question but I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with, uh, but you have to be intentional. Awesome. Thank you all so, so much for being a part of the event today. You were excellent top tier panelists and we really appreciate it. And if any of the students have questions for them, you can always um, still post them in the chat and also there'll be a post event survey and you can always pop your questions in there and we can get them to them. So maybe we can get some answers for you. So thank you. I think Katie and I are gonna turn it over um, to our next group. And the moderators are Mark Edwards and Joel King. So we will turn our cameras off and let you get started. Thank you again. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Katie and Helena. And uh, next we have an outstanding uh, group of panelists here uh, to talk to students about the application process and the do's and the don'ts. Um, this is uh, something you really want to pay attention to. Hopefully, we have some really good questions um, that come through the chat on this because they're really going to show you how to uh, stand out. 
Uh, so joining us today from uh, Mercy Health is Taryn Ozzelina. Uh, and the, she is the um, Talent Acquisition Manager um, at Mercy Health. And then we also have joining us from uh, Westchester Hospital, we have Molly Stevens, the Director of Human Resources, as well as Casey Richards, the Manager of Business Operations. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joel and uh, we're gonna ask some, some good questions to our panelists. Thanks, Mark. And thank you everyone for joining us today for this event. So I think this is gonna be very informative students. Um, and you're probably gonna to wanna to take some notes as you go through these questions. So to our panelists, uh, just kind of open it up and explain a little bit about your role and responsibilities in the hiring process. I'll go ahead and go first, guys. Um, so I am uh, actually recently promoted to the talent acquisition manager over our um, sourcing candidates pipeline group um, at Bon Secours Mercy Health. A lot of people don't really know what candidate sourcing is, um, and that really is just a more proactive form of recruitment. So we do go after and try to attract candidates who have never, never applied with our organization or who haven't, you know, recently. So we're always trying to engage and get, um, you know, talent for those really, truly hard to fill positions within our organization. Um, and so a, a way for um, you all maybe to sort of advance um, and have someone like my team or myself reach out to you is really just to keep that professional like social media um, account like LinkedIn or keep an updated resume on platforms like Indeed, things like that, um, where we go out and search and reach out to people. Um, if you keep your job titles or, or roles that you're interested in up to date, then we would reach out to you potentially with job opportunities even without you applying, which is kind of nice. Um, kind of one of those things about it's who you know and um, things like that. So we kind of get to know you and, and help to promote you through our hiring process. Hi guys, uh, my name is Molly Stevens. I'm the director of HR at Westchester Hospital. Um, my part of the hiring process, we actually have a team, a separate team of talent acquisition. They do all of our hiring for us. However, uh, my team here within operations, we play a big part in that as well. And, you know, meeting the candidates, collaborating with the talent acquisition team, with any of the candidates that apply or any questions that they have from a site specific um, perspective. And we kind of help them and aid that onboarding process as candidates are hired on to, to our location. And uh, my name is Casey Richards, and I'm the manager of business operations, uh, like Mark said. And um, basically, my role kind of in the business side of things is really evaluating all the positions and helping get all of our um, discussing with our leaders and trying to get positions filled um, and approved at our senior leadership meetings. So then the talent acquisition and HR can kind of move on that end. Um, I participate in the peer interview process as well. And then um, I'm really involved in the high school uh, shadowing and volunteer kind of realm of things and trying to get students into the hospital here with COVID. It's a little tricky now, but, um, you know, really working to get students from our surrounding schools and to shadow our different departments. So. Thank you. So the next question for our panelists, uh, if you guys could share a little bit about what successful candidates do during the application process that helps them stand out to get an interview, um, or maybe share some of what unsuccessful candidates might do to eliminate themselves from the process. So Taryn, if you want to talk a little bit about that first. Sure. Um, for me, honestly, I think step one is just completing the application and all the steps um, required, being honest and accurate as you fill that information out, um, truly is step one. So we have a lot of people who kind of start our process, but do not complete it. And um, we, you know, with technology and IT advancing, we are, you know, putting some things into place that kind of eliminate those candidates that don't complete those steps. Um, so those who do stand out automatically. Um, our hiring process does have quite a few steps, to be honest, with assessments to make sure you're the best fit for the role. Um, we have some on-demand interviews, so that's where you actually record yourself um, answering a few questions, and those 
answers go out to the hiring managers for them to take a look at prior to, um, you know, having you um, either face to face or, or do a virtual interview with them. Um, there are HR questions and, you know, pre qualifying questions just to make sure, again, before we um, call you up or invite you in that you are a good fit for that position. So, just filling out and completing all of those steps will put you ahead of others. Um, and then really, I think for this group, just to have a professional resume, even if you don't have past work experience, um, to list qualities and experiences that could relate you to the medical field. So customer service or caring for others, things like that, um, that you've done maybe in your you know, personal life or um, childcare, just things that will help us to see some of those um, skills that would relate over into the medical field would be very helpful. And hi, this is Molly again. I'll just kind of add on to everything that uh, Taryn said. She was kind of spot on. Um, I'll just add, you know, on your resume, um, you know, putting any volunteer, anything, anytime that you can volunteer, that is huge. Anytime that you can do any type of customer or community service, um, within your community, that is huge on a resume. Um, and so, and then just having a good work history, but kind of do not underestimate yourself and all the stuff that you can do and all those volunteer opportunities, because those are always good things to see on a resume. So that's, I just add on to what Taryn said. And um, I think that it's prior to even submitting the application. If you can get into the organization and like I said, shadow with the department or do some volunteering within the hospital, that is already giving you kind of a leg up on people because your name is out there. People know you, um, they're familiar with you. So not that you're automatically gonna get the job because of that, but it does give you kind of um, a leg up on people. And then I would also um, say, kind of tagging on what Taryn said is really just work on the resume because that resume is what is going to sell you to even get an interview. So make sure that is professional, cleaned up, there's no typos, um, you know, and that you really are selling yourself and all of the great experiences that you have done. Even, you know, small things that you don't think people may, you know, think are big, they can, you know, be the difference between you getting the job and not, or getting an interview and not. So I would just put kind of everything on that application. Uh, there's a couple really good questions in the chat that I want to make sure we get to. So one of the things, and you've each kind of touched on um, some specific things with the resume or social media, are there any steps that are maybe missed by high school students, particularly, or new candidates? Or is there uh, something that maybe a, a high school student should really pay attention to in that application process besides um, their resume? I think um, two things come to my mind, kind of reiterating what we just said. But um, sometimes people, and I actually have a, a high school student in my life who was recently applying for jobs who said, I don't have a resume, I don't have that work experience. And we had to sit down and kind of brainstorm and think about some of the groups, you know, that they participate with in school that we could add, some leadership opportunities, just kind of brainstorming all of that to make a resume. I think if you apply without one, again, there are people who, um, who are applying with them and, and we're gonna look at those, those folks first. So making sure that you do, um, come up with a, a resume to, to submit. And then um, the other thing would be, you know, if you're in a program now where you're getting some training or some certifications, just making sure you include those. Those help you stand out as well. Um, and then just to add on to what Taryn said, you know, I think through the, the application process at times, um, I don't really see anything. A, a lot of times th people kind of over, uh, they miss things. So things are not completely filled out. That's what we see a lot of is there's incomplete applications. So there's a lot of holes. And then kind of just to add on to what Taryn said is the resume. The resume is huge. Think about maybe the school activities that you're involved in, any type of clubs, committees, anything that you're involved in throughout school. Those are also important things to add onto your resume. While it might be small in the beginning, that's okay. Um, but it does give you um, kind of a, a stepping stone to kind of get that resume started. 
Um, and then I would say in, in regards to the resume, I would kind of review what the organization that you're applying for the job for and try to maybe tailor some like certain things like your um, qualities and whatnot that you may include on the resume to fit what their values and their mission is because if they if someone's reviewing that resume and see like those certain words stand out and your experiences and kind of how um, that kind of fits into the organization's culture that is going to kind of show the person that's reviewing it like, wow, this person, you know, does fit into what we are looking for. But then I would also just reach out to anyone in your, you know, teachers, um, whoever, to make sure that they review the resume first um, to get some, you know, feedback, because you may think that it looks great. And I'm sure that, you know, it, uh, it is a nice product, but there's always something that can be tweaked or changed. Um, and that goes for anyone and everyone. So um, just reach out for help, I guess. Casey, another thing uh, that you've talked about is job shadowing. And there was a couple questions in the chat about who they should contact. So maybe who they should contact uh, at UC Health. And then if you have uh, suggestions for other facilities that they should reach out to. Yeah, so um, at UC Health specifically, we usually go through the um, schools, like teachers or whoever's kind of in charge of the shadowing programs at the different high schools. If you don't have a shadowing program, first I would start there asking who is in charge kind of of getting those opportunities um, established. If the school does not have those, they are more than happy to um, reach out to myself or call the hospital and someone can get in contact with me. Um, but we also on our website and a lot of other organizations, they have it on their website of shadowing opportunities or volunteer opportunities. Um, there's applications on there to, um, you know, kind of get that started. We, we had a couple other good questions regarding job shadowing. Um, so one student uh, wanted to know just what, what does a job shadow look like um, in the healthcare uh, field? And then also uh, involving shadows this summer with COVID or things starting to open up, what do you guys see there? Um, and this is for, for both Mercy Health because I know you guys do some things as well. Yeah, so um, in regards to shadowing currently here at Westchester Hospital, we are unfortunately not doing job shadowing currently. We do expect for it to open up in the near future. Um, that is kind of telling. I think they were gonna evaluate on July 1st um, and kind of see where we're at um, COVID wise and whatnot. But we do offer um, with some schools, we've been starting to do some virtual shadowings which kind of just consists of the manager or the department leader sitting down and kind of going over a day in the life of that department um, or that job occupation. So, but a typical shadow experience here is when the student comes, it's usually from like eight to noon and they go in, into various different part departments here in the hospital and kind of just, um, you know, tag along with that department individual and see what the daily work and the daily flow of that department is. So the idea is to really um, spread them out and get them a whole um, hospital wide kind of vision. So they're gonna be going to respiratory, they're gonna be going to the, nurse, the inpatient nursing units, um, rehab to ship because the student may think if you know they have a lot of their mom is a nurse, their aunt is a nurse, their uncle is a doc, you know, they, they may think that they want to be a nurse, but they get into the um, hospital and they do something in rehab and really find that their passion is in rehab. So that's the idea of trying to get the holistic view of the hospital. Um, and that's kind of how our shadowing experiences are structured. And then I'll just add on in regards to shadowing. So we do that shadowing, you know, that kind of what Casey is talking about. But as we um, as we interview candidates and we have when your candidates go through that selection process, um, we do shadowing. We allow candidates that we are going to be considering for a position. We do currently put them through a shadowing. It's like two to four hours. 
they come in and they work, they kind of shadow on the shift that they would potentially be be working. And um, we have been doing that for a few years now, and we found that to be very rewarding. A lot of uh, candidates will self um, select out. Um, it's maybe not going to be a good fit. Um, but that is one thing as you go through the interview process, do not be afraid to ask to do a shadow if you're being considered as a candidate, because it's only going to give you just that eye opening experience if, if it is a good fit for you. And our process is exactly, it sounds like the same as, as theirs, kind of reevaluating um, coming up soon. Um, even our internship opportunities are, you know, virtual and online now just due to COVID. Um, so that did change a lot of things. I um, also love the on the job shadowing while you're interviewing. It does self select people out. You see some procedures and things that may take place um, day to day on that job and decide that is not the, the role for me. Um, it also gives people a great chance to take notes and ask questions. And also, I mean, don't forget you're still on a job interview. So those two to four hours are really telling about, um, you know, how someone will fit in with the team and things like that. Um, so we are pretty much spot on um, there with, with kind of timeline and, and everything about shadowing. Well, both of you perfect lead into our next question. So let's say our students have successfully completed the application process and you have contacted them for an interview. Um, share a little bit about what successful candidates do during the interview process that helps them stand out um, and even some things that they might be unsuccessful at that eliminate them so the students cannot do those things. I think right now um, for us, majority of our interviews are virtual. So I think step one right now is taking a look um, best practices and in virtual interviewing. I know on our website, we have some, some tools for that. Um, we have some video recording um, capabilities where we've, um, you know, our talent acquisition and HR teams have shared some of those best practices, um, you know, come prepared and professional. Um, a key for me, even when I interview is, you can think of every you know, question that they may ask you and you'll never come up with the right combination of questions. So instead of really worrying about what someone may ask you, I try to think about what points do I wanna make sure I express you know, during this interview? What do I wanna get out um, and make sure they, they find out about me or hear about me? Um, and so as those questions come up, you find a way to kind of fit those points in um, so I think that's a really great tool for, for preparing for an interview. Um, and the other thing is to show what we call soft skills. So especially a high school student who isn't, um, you know, experienced or, or fully trained maybe um, on, on these roles, um, soft skills are going to be a good attitude, you know, if you're dependable, if you are flexible, what's your motivations? Um, do you have a strong work ethic? Things like that, that we really look for and decide, you know what, this is the right person to fit in with our team and we can you know, train them up and, and teach them how to do this job. Um, and I'll just add on to what uh, Taryn said. So um, the soft skills is huge. We truly hire on the soft skills because we know we can train on the hard skills. Those soft skills being kind, being flexible, open to change. Um, all of those skills is what we look for in an individual or the, uh, the traits that we look for in a candidate um, because we know that we can train that individual. But if they have a good attitude, that's truly what we're looking for. Um, also, it's important to be prepared and know, know the organization a little bit, know a little bit about the organization, um, familiarize yourself with the position a little bit that you're applying to. And I always love when candidates come with questions. Um, the more questions that candidates bring and ask me, that means they're engaged and they, they really do want to learn about the organization. And I, I would just say that make sure one of the biggest things is professional dress because you would be surprised about how many people come in and <laughs> not in professional attire so um, that is one of the biggest things because that's the first thing you know the first impression of you is kind of you walking through the door um, 
and just show passion for the organization show that you know the organization do your research kind of see what the organization is about what their values are um and then i always think that the biggest thing that people miss when they interview is a follow-up like thank you email to the person that they're interviewing with that goes such a, a long way because it shows that you know, you took that extra step to kind of follow up, thank them for their time. And, um, you know, they're going to be top of mind when they kind of go over the candidates that they interviewed. So. And, and Casey, kind of to follow up on your uh, professional dress attire, I know a question that's come up recently is if I'm interviewing virtually, do I still have to dress professionally? So if you guys could maybe oh. somebody talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts of uh, virtual interviewing. Um, so I would say, you know, if you're interviewing virtually, yes, you're still going to want to dress professionally. Um, and honestly, I find that if when I if I'm dressing professionally, the more um, confident and just the more engaged I am in that conversation, um, I kind of chuckled because it would be it's amazing of how unprofessional people dress when they come in for an interview, and it just kind of shows that maybe they're not, they don't really care if they get the job or not. So, you know, dressing for success is huge. Um, if you go out on the website, you can Google the do's and don'ts of interviewing and how to prepare yourself for an interview. And those, all of those statements on those are pretty accurate. So, uh, but dressing um, for the position is, is a key component. And just to tag on, a lot of people think that when they're interviewing for like, a hospital position if the position that you're working in you're wearing scrubs most of the time that does not mean to wear scrubs to the interview i would dress you know professional for the interview because a lot of times people will come in in scrubs and you're like well it, you know that's not very professional in my mind and if but. people do some people will dress or come into the interview with scrubs on but they typically will ask the recruiter um, and just say hey i'm getting off of work can i come in my right. scrubs that way, and I'm like, yes, you can come in your scrubs and then we'll make the managers aware. So just creating that awareness, if you do have to come in your scrubs, it's okay, but just make sure you run that by the HR team, just so they're aware of, as to why, you know, maybe you're, you're coming in scrubs for the interview. Thank you. Uh, next thing is if you could share a little bit about what are the qualities that a great employee for your organization would have? So um, again, going back to those soft skills, I think that is the key, just um, outlining and, and helping us to understand um, who you are, the, the sort of attitude, the flexibility that you bring. Um, you know, something in our world is um, we do things every day that aren't, you know, a part of our job. And we, you don't say that, you do them, you learn from it, it helps um, you to grow and learn in advance. Um, so, you know, having that mindset is key. Um, the other thing that's big, and at least in my world in reviewing resumes is that past behaviors are a predictor for future behaviors. So something I wanted to make sure I bring up on this um, talk is about having short stays in employment. Um, you know, I know as a young, you know, when my younger days, a year felt like a lifetime, um, but it's not. <laughs> um, when you're looking at a resume, if you see, you know, two months on a job and four months and six months, um, that really says to me that you're probably going to stay with us for, you know, five to six months. And we're really looking for our more long term, um, you know, fits. It costs a lot for an organization to hire and train. And so we want long term employees. So, um, you know, sometimes stick it out, see if things get better, um, you know, those sort of things, instead of maybe leaving an organization early or um, before having that next position lined up, things like that. I think um, Taryn pretty much wrapped with that question. I think, again, the soft skills, um, being flexible, being open to change. Um, any job that you do, there's going to be change. So being having that open mind, be able to adapt to that change within that role is huge. Um, and I think just being patient as you know, as change does happen. So Taryn pretty much hit on all those uh, key characteristics. 
Yeah, and I, I keep saying this, but just show that you have passion for the work and for the job that you're doing. Um, a big thing in healthcare is teamwork. So really highlight and show that you work well in a team because in the hospital, nothing can be done by one individual. It takes every single person, whether that's a, you know someone working in EVS, a nurse, someone in therapy, a doctor, everyone is on an even playing field because everyone's job matters. So um, just show that you can work with one, you know, with a group of people, because that is going to kind of highlight that you can truly fit into the culture at the organization. We had a, a good question in the chat uh, that I think goes along well with uh, what we were going to ask about. So I'm going to kind of combine it uh, together. Uh, and the question was, what type of programs are available to help us get on track with our careers. So I, I think this essentially is asking, what advice do you have to a high school student right now that's looking to get into the healthcare field? Uh, where, where do they need to look to? I think this is a hard one, guys, because there's so many different avenues in healthcare that you can take. Um, so I think that's probably, you know, number one is either trying to figure that out. Of course, I know, when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, you know, grew up. Um, I only in the last maybe six years figured that out. Um, but, you know, starting down maybe a path, um, you know, we've talked about all these shadow opportunities and I know COVID has, you know, put a little bit of a damper on some of that, but those are great ways to start. I know all of our, you know, our Mercy Health as well as our competitors have, you um, programs that help people become, you know, STNAs, um, MAs, you know, we were sort of helping uh, to educate and grow our communities into roles like that. So um, honestly, you can reach out to some of us on, on like LinkedIn and just, you can ask, never hurts to ask, do you know of a program? Do you know who I can talk to? Um, things like that are a great place to start. Um, I know earlier in the earlier panel, they talked about, it's all about who you know, and I, I truly believe that. That's how I ended up at, at Von Secours Mercy Health. Um, a friend reached out and asked if I was interested in learning more about a position, and you know, here I am six years later. So um, I think that's a great place to start with who you know and just sort of seeing what opportunities are there and finding out what fits you best. Again, I'll just kind of echo what Taryn said. Um, yeah, networking is key. And I think, you know, maybe talking with some of your um, high school counselors and talking through some of your likes and interests that you have, um, that would probably, you know, be very helpful. Um, and maybe they can kind of help kind of walk you through what those opportunities are kind of maybe, you know, what your likes are. And then, you know, getting involved, I would say any type of young professional organizations that you can, which is part of networking, that is huge. So, you know, any type of, you know, interactions where you can expand um, kind of maybe what your interests are and then reaching out to the hospitals or wherever you might be seeking employment and um, looking at a shadowing program, that will definitely give you that insight as well. So another question going back to uh, resumes uh, that have come up. Uh, what about high school students that lack experience? Uh, sometimes uh, we know that uh, employers are looking for people with experience, but high schoolers that don't have that experience, that might have a cert certification like an STNA or, or something like that. What do they put on their resume to really stand out? Do they put high school classes that they've done? Do they put on things that they do at home? How do they demonstrate those skills that you're really looking for on a resume? I think as we you know talked about earlier, the organizations that you're a part of in high school, the community, you know, outreach, um, church, you know, organizations and things that you've just done above and beyond um, are really helpful to share. Um, again, the, any customer service or caring for others is great for the healthcare world to see, um, you know, kind of bedside manner and, and those customer service soft skills. Um, I, I think it's per individual just to sort of think through what have I done? What can I showcase and highlight 
enlist. Um, they don't have to be, you know, jobs per se. It can be just some of those um, leadership skills that you've gained in being a part of an organization. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything to add. I'll just add, yeah, you said it very nicely, Taryn. And I think I'll just add, you know, I think, you know, I've seen, we don't expect, I mean, we know you're in high school, so we don't expect a full blown out resume of tons of work experience. But I think as what Taryn said, you know, don't underestimate some of those things that you're involved in. Um, I've seen people that nanny, um, they have a nanny job. They've added that to the resume. That's great to add to your resume. So I would just really fine tune and truly think about all of those involvements that you have and add those to your resume. Another question here uh, that came in about the medical explorers. And I know Mercy um, uh, works with the medical explorers. Uh, Taryn, are you familiar with medical explorers and uh, what they're doing currently? Um, at I'm Mercy? not actually. I would love to learn. <laughs> All right. Well, Donna Lauber, I know, is on the phone. Uh, but the, uh, the the question with medical explorers, it does still exist. Uh, Forest Hills uh, currently is doing uh, medical explorers there at Mercy Anderson. And uh, Mer Mercy Claremont uh, has also been involved in Mercy uh, exp or, uh, uh, Healthcare Explorers as well. So if you contact your school counselor, they might be able to connect you with some of the great things that Mercy is uh, doing over there. Um, and last question um, is just a one takeaway uh, as far as communication goes. Um, how do you recommend uh, communicating uh, with an, a potential future employer? Uh, what's the most important aspect of communication when you're trying to get a job? Hmm. Um you know, follow the steps, uh, be prompt. I would say a few things that um, people kind of fail at are like not having a voicemail box set up or a full voicemail box. So we're trying to reach you to make a job offer and we can't, um, you know, um, a, a thank you message after an interview goes a long way, guys. I recently was looking for a, a team member and, you know, I had a few people just email even a thank you and some who didn't and you know the person who got the job was someone who who thanked us for our time um so you know those things go a long way still today yeah i will just kind of i i did that had the same reaction as tara did when that question was asked um but i think just to add on to that you know definitely um email um communication and i would say uh, one thing that we're finding and tara could probably agree there's a lot of ghosting that happens um, currently within the workforce. So if you are not, maybe after you've gone through the interview process and you're not interested in a position or you want to decline an offer, please let that employer know. Um, we um, get ghosted uh, quite often. Um, it it, it kind of just, it's like, okay, what do we do? But it's it's very important just to communicate, you know, your interest or whether you're not interested anymore, email communication, having your emails updated. And then to Ter Taryn's point, have your voicemail activated because we will leave messages. Um, and there's often at times we find that there is no voicemail set up or the voicemail is full. So we can't even leave a message and then there's no return with emails. So just kind of keeping that in mind as you're communicating with employers. I think that's a great point, Molly. And if you could, real quick, just explain the term ghosting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, what happens is we, you know, typically candidates, they'll go through the interview process. Um, ghosting can happen in many different ways. Sometimes we'll, you know, we'll interview them and then we will just never hear from them ever again. We may be calling to make them an offer and we'll say, we are calling to make you an offer and we will not get a return call. We will not get a reply email or anything. They just pretty much just disappear. Um, it also happens where we've hired the individual, they've gone through the drug screen, they've gone through the hiring process, and then on the first day of orientation, they're not there, and then we reach out and they're, they're nowhere to be found. They do not return our calls, they do not return our emails, so they pretty much just drop us when we expected them to start. So it does happen in many different um, realms of the onboarding and hiring process. Um, but it's just pretty much, they just, they just disappear. So that help. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I really appreciate our panelists time today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I know there's a couple questions we weren't able to get to about shadowing. Um, I'll try and follow up with uh, those individuals in the chat. 
Um, but on deck next is Amanda McGee from uh, West Claremont uh, uh, Career Center, as well as the ever ubiquitous Sean Kelly. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to you guys. Good morning. And while I'm sure it's a privilege to be from West Claremont, I'm from Warren County Career Center. So it's an honor to be here today. Oh, sorry. I meant, I meant. That's all right, Mark. That's all right. It's normally Joel who gets the hard time in the group, so I'm okay with it. I'll take it today. So good That's morning. That's funny. Sean, you good? Amanda, are you there? Okay, there, now I can hear you. Um, and I can see you too. Uh, hey, everyone, good to see everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, this is the final panel. So we hope you uh, we hope you have enjoyed so far. I've enjoyed so far and I've learned a lot. Um, I may start my career over and, and go into healthcare after all this great advice today. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, uh, we have a great group of participants and this final panel uh, this is kind of the, 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 the culmination of the whole process. So th th we're going to talk about um, when you finally get that opportunity to go in for an interview and you finally have a time uh, to, to meet with the team from the, uh, the prospective employer, how do you prepare for that? And what do you, what looks like success? What doesn't? Uh, so we're thrilled to have, and I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves, but we're thrilled to have Megan and Lois and Nashik and Money Resumen uh, here with us today to just share some of their experiences. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some funny stories um, as we've all seen uh, some interviews over time. Uh, some are more memorable than others. And um, th they're gonna just help us get to that point where, okay, we've, we've, we've gotten our resume together. We filled out the application. As so many of our panelists earlier today said, you know, we went through the whole, we did everything they asked us to do. We didn't ghost anyone. We, uh, we, we filled out all the boxes and we submitted all the documents that they're asking for and we got invited for an interview. And so then here you are. And, and sometimes for a lot of us, uh, that can be the most nerve wracking part, right? Because you're, you're truly, I mean, you've already shared so much. You've already prepared so much. And then you finally have to go in, you, I look at it as you get to go in and put your best self forward. And so, so for this final panel, um, th this is kind of that, this is kind of the make or break moment, right? Mm -hmm. With that, uh, Megan, do you wanna start off just, just a quick introduction and then we'll get going with uh, questions. But Megan, you wanna start and then Lois, then the Sheik and then uh, Money Resman. Yeah, for sure. Can you guys all hear me okay? Perfect. So I'm Megan Duell. I'm one of the HR business partners with the Christ Hospital Health Network. Um, I've been here for almost three years now. A lot of my current role um, focuses in on really recruitment and retention strategies. So how do we bring in quality talent to the network, essentially, um, some of you, right? And then also keep our employees working here. Um, as far as my background, a big part of my life, I would say, was growing up playing sports. So I played soccer actually my whole life, really. I actually ended up playing here at the College of uh, University of Cincinnati, um, right across near down here in Clifton from the Christ Hospital. And I think playing sports my whole life really taught me a lot of the skills that I actually use in my professional career today. So teamwork, collaboration, accountability, reliability, um, community, you know, communication skills, and just overall work ethic. Um, and I think that's really transitioned into the role I have today. So I'm super excited to be on here and answer some fun questions. Thank you so much. Lois, would you like to go next with a quick introduction? Sorry, I was on mute. So now I'm back. Uh, Lois Mills, I'm the Vice President, Chief People Officer for Otterbein Senior Life. We're retirement living and nursing home communities across Ohio and in Indiana. Um, I've been here in this role for um, just about 12 years, uh, but my career prior to that, um, very uh, different for some people. My undergrad degree is actually in engineering. I worked as an industrial engineer for both Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson for a number of years. When I was with j, &J it was when I made the change to human resources. Are you crazy, engineering? Uh, what I find is industrial engineering is the science and engineering of processes and systems. So instead of working on manufacturing processes, I work on people processes. Um, so that's what I've dedicated my career to 
through the whole variety of HR areas uh, right now in terms of talent acquisition, as you've heard throughout all this, healthcare is a very challenging field these days to hire and retain uh, people. So for those who are interested, and I hope many of you will pursue healthcare careers, you will find a rewarding career and employers who are ready to embrace you. So I look forward to our panel today. Thank you so much, Lois. Uh, Nashik, how about you next? Hey, how's it going? Um, so I am working with Premier Health. I work as a recruiter. I've been here for I'll be two years in July. Um, some of a bit of my background, you know, I grew up working in retail, um, getting my bachelor's degree. Once I got my degree, you know, I did a few odd end jobs. I did taxes for a little bit, worked in a little accounting firm, um, eventually got my position here at Premier. Um, started off as an onboarding specialist, which would pretty much just kind of help you make sure any new hires get started on time and make sure they hit that. Um, they're starting, they're good to clear. Um, after that, I was promoted up to a sourcing role where I would try and reach out to nurses, bring them on board. And then I finally got moved into a recruiting role. Um, so I definitely have a background in, in various different areas. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. I love the chief people officer, Miss Lois. I love that title. That's pretty cool. Yes. So the next question is really talking about an example from an, an exemplar. An exemplar being the best of the best that you could hope for during an interview. It's really two parts I should have said. Do you have an example of an exemplar interview? And do you have an interview that you'd like to forget? <laughs> Anyone is free to respond. I'll jump in. Uh, this is Lois. So my exemplar interview uh, would be actually one for this role. Um, since I came to uh, Otterbein with no healthcare background, nothing. My background is all in manufacturing, sales, and marketing. So uh, part of the interview, the panel before spoke to the preparation. That's part of what made an exemplar interview because I did a lot of research since I knew nothing about healthcare and nothing about long-term care. So I felt prepared in general to know and to be able to ask good questions during the interview. Um, then in the interview, um, it was a panel interview with three people, including the CEO. And I felt really good about it because I had thought about how to translate my HR experience and manufacturing sales and marketing to healthcare. So having pre-thought about that, I think I was able, obviously, I guess, convinced them that I could do HR and healthcare. Um, I, the other piece, though, for me that made it exemplar was the follow-up. Because as, uh, again, the panel before spoke to, a thank you note's always good. And particularly in the high school students, I think you, know, you would be writing a general thank you note. For me, I was able to provide an analysis. I did a SWOT, strengths, strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that I saw for the organization from the HR perspective. So I think that helped me stand out from other candidates. Now, do you want my worst? Sure, if you would like oh, to continue. Sure, real quick. So my worst is a college student. I had the opportunity to interview with uh, the bank in New York. So exciting, flew across the country because I was in California, all that kind of stuff. And I only had one or two, you know, suits I had bought to be prepared for interviews. So I wore my light blue, Beautiful suit. It was a bank. Banks at that time weren't wearing light blue. Everyone was in these dark colors and I just really stood out more than I probably wanted to. Um, and I just think that was a contributor. I'm not sure why I didn't get the job, but I've always thought that was a contributor because I hadn't thought about the company I was going to and the culture and what it would be like. So that was my worst. Oh my gosh, Lois, that, that brings, I have to jump in on that because that brings back one of my funniest, but also just horrifying experiences ever. Very similar, but on the opposite side of it, I went for an interview. I was uh, living in New York City at the time. It was July. I didn't realize just how hot oh. it was going to be. I had just moved there like the month before. Just how hot it was going to be walking through the city dressed in a suit that I, that was a dark suit. Cause I was thinking like you, like at the time banking kind of thing, 
completely inappropriate. It was a really casual company. And I walked in, I was the only person for miles in a suit. Everyone's looking at me like, where is this guy from that he's dressed like that in July in New York City? And uh, I was sweating so bad, the, the uh, administrative person who was sitting at the desk took pity on me. And she literally went and got me towels to like oh. off my face. I was in my young 20s. And here I thought I was, you know, like it was New York City. I was going to put my best suit on. And I was walking way too many blocks to be walking to an interview. And it was a total nightmare. But the lesson is, and I think Lois, you learned it too, do your research ahead of time, kind of figure out all those things. And for, and, and for everyone watching, just also remember that people are good and they want you to do your best. They want you to show up ready to go and because they want to hire you. I mean, they don't want to keep going through the process of looking for another candidate. They want to hire you. So give them reasons to. So Lois, I'm so glad you brought that one up because I just totally brought back to mind that story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Sean, if I can kind of tap into that too. I mean, I think that you bring up a great point there, both you and Lewis. I think um, candidates don't always understand, like we are your advocate, right? We want you, we want to set you up for success here in our business. We want you to do well. Um, and we want to help you, you know, through the process. But candidates have to know they have to help themselves, right? And so that means like what all panel two said as well is being prepared, being on time to the interview. Um, we always say early is on time, right? On time is late. So be prepared, show up early, make sure um, you kind of know exactly where you're going. Um, dress appropriately, like we've talked about. So some of the best interviews, I think obviously um, they've, they've, they show that they've prepared themselves, right? Um, and they're, set, they're setting themselves up for success in that interview process. So dressing appropriately, like we've talked about, um, showing up on time, right? If you have questions in advance of where to go, how to get there, even if we did that and you're still confused, let us know. Um, the more questions you ask and the more curious you are actually shows us you're, you're really engaged in the process and you want to do well. Um, so I think another really piece of advice that I've seen some from some of the best interviews, just to kind of continue the conversation here, are people who are confident and have awareness, right? And, you know, be confident in what you bring to the table and who you are um, and what you're looking for a job. And sometimes maybe that is even that you don't know what you want to do just yet. And that's okay. Um, being honest and vulnerable and saying, you know what, I'm not really sure, but here's what I do know about myself. So either I like helping people. That's what I know. Or, you know what, I, I like cleaning and I like staying organized. Um, or, you know what, at this point, if I am just trying to like start a career and make money, right? But I'm not really sure where to go or how to do that. Um, that's okay. That's where we kind of jump in as HR professionals. And that's what we're passionate about is like leading to help you find where you want to go in your career. And hey, here's some, here's some starting roles that um, might be, you know, a good starting avenue for you here at our network. And um, to kind of have those career development conversations with you. So everything I think panel two said and what Lewis and Sean just said is like spot on um, and just adding on kind of that confidence piece and also the vulnerability piece, um, especially high school students, you maybe aren't at a time in your life where you know exactly where you want to go or what you want to do. And that is okay. Um, but letting us know that and being very vulnerable and open and honest to the recruitment team um, from the very start is great. And we'll help kind of guide and recommend some areas that may be a good starting point. Thank you. I would say, I guess from, from uh, you know, interviews that maybe haven't gone as well, just to, I guess, go on the other side of the to token here. Um, really overall, I would say, um, it, it has been when people don't show up, right? Um, I know panel two kind of talked about ghosting. So, you know, either when people are showing up late, they're not on time, um, if it is really hard to communicate with you throughout the process. Um, so if you're not really available from a communication standpoint, whether that's texting, calling, email, um, whatever that is, um, if you're not dressed appropriately um, and or don't seem to be like engaged, right? Or wanna be there. Um, and I think we're gonna get into kind of maybe potentially some more questions too, and, and um, kind of what that looks like, but um, show us that you're engaged and you want to be there. And that's our hope um, is that you, you do want to be there, right? You're, you're wanting this job, um, but make sure that, you know, you're really engaged and understanding the questions we're asking um, and what we're looking for during that time. Thank you. 
and, and I'll have to agree with Megan on that. Um, you know, all the points that she made are great. Um, for me specifically, some of the best and worst that I've dealt with had to deal with, um, honestly, um, attitude. I think attitude goes a long way, especially with high school students. Um, you know, some of you aren't going to have a lot of experience coming in, and that's okay. Um, but like I said, I've had people who come in with great attitudes, go get her attitude, and that goes a long way. Um, coming in, being uninterested, having a bad attitude, that will, you know, end interviews pretty quickly. Um, but I think that's kind of one of the biggest things that I've seen on both ends, good and bad, um, that I've dealt with. Thank you. I got a direct John, can oh, add on. Go oh, can I add on a little brief about what Megan okay. was saying? agree with everything. In terms of being on time, what does that mean? Um, so my recommendation is that you arrive about 10 minutes before your interview. Um, further, the night before, drive there, make sure you know how to get there, get all those things out the way. And then I really recommend you get there 20 minutes ahead of time, but you sit in your car, you sit across the street, you do something. Because when you go in to the interviewer 20 minutes ahead of time, that makes me nervous because I'm probably in a meeting and I'm like, oh, I've made this person sit out there and wait for me. So for my recommendation is be earlier, but don't come into the building until about 10 minutes before your interview time. And a piece of advice I was given years ago was that if, if you're going into a building where they can see the parking lot, they're watching you from the time you get out of your car. And so make sure that you're not doing anything a little crazy or, you know, make sure all of your, your hair, your glasses, everything's ready to go when you get out of the vehicle because you don't want anybody seeing you, you know, doing weirdness, right? Actually, I have something really quick, funny to add. Um, an interview on a high school student once, um, their parent, their mom had brought them and we had this big window, front window, doing this, what you said, we were watching. And he got out, his mom got out, she's making sure his hair is all fixed, his ties, and it was so cute. We loved it, but I'm sure the student would have been mortified if they'd realized we were watching them. That would probably be me. I, I laugh, but I have a seven-year-old who, that, that might be me. Um, yes. Along the lines of the appropriateness of once you're in the interview, I think, everyone in their life needs to have someone who will say those difficult things to you. You know, sometimes it's grandmas. A lot of times it's women in our life who say those really difficult things. And I just want to make sure that we say, put the phones away and make sure that you guys always have your phone on silent. Can you guys give any examples of just, I know we've talked a lot about engagement, but having that constant, um, distraction has that been an issue yeah I would say um in you know definitely in some interviews that I've been in and as a business partner you know I'm not one of the primary recruiters so I'm not doing as much as you know um one of our town acquisition partners but I've definitely been engaged and I've jumped into recruiting and I've done recruiting in my career and there's been plenty where whether it's an on-site hiring event and you're sitting across from somebody and you're in person you know, and the phone rings, right? And it's right here and it's a quick look. We all, you know, this is kind of the way of life, right? We're used to it. We understand, we get it, but it's back to, I guess, what we spoke to earlier is that's kind of already an indicator of your engagement um, and your focus during that time with us, right? Um, we understand things come up. We understand there's emergencies um, and things do happen. Um, but try and put that away, put it on silent, just as Amanda said, um, and kind of give your full focus during that time. Um, because the other expectation, I guess, on our end from an HR perspective is that, you know, you've solidified with us that this time is a good time for you, right? And that it works. And so if it ends up being that something's coming up, again, things come up, we get it. We all have, you know, personal situations pop up or emergencies. Um, but we would expect that, you've really told anybody, family, friends, you know, people who maybe reached out like, hey, you know, like I'm busy during this time or I have this time blocked um, and you're giving us, you know, your full attention um, and showing that engagement. Um, and if not, again, that's just an indicator of what's really their engagement, their focus, their awareness during this time. Lewis, Nasik, I don't know if you guys have anything to add as well. 
Yeah, I, I, um, I actually just recently, and this wasn't me directly, but I had a candidate interview with, um, you know, I spoke to them, screened them, set them up for an interview with the manager. Um, and with some of our clinical positions, what they'll do is they'll job shadow sometimes right after interview. So I was notified afterwards that the person when they were job shadowing were on their phone the whole time. And, you know, they were with just a normal PCT and maybe they thought, oh, nobody's around or they're just, but the PCT will report that to the manager, comes back to me. And that's, a, that's pretty much like, you know, they get disqualified from that because it just shows that they're not interested. Um, so that's definitely a thing. Just making sure that you're staying engaged is, is a huge thing. Yeah, and ditto, I would just say, again, the definition of silent is not on buzz, on stun, because um, that's irritating too. You keep hearing this buzz going off. Um, it's turn your phone off, totally off, then you don't have to even worry about anything. I left my phone on. I was hoping people heard it ring when we first started as an example of how irritating that is. So. That was a good, that was a good real world. <laughs> Thank you for giving us a real world example. Uh, Sheik, I want to go back to, to you for a second. The, um, so we've talked about time a lot. Uh, I mean, Megan just said, you know, you said this time was good. Honor the time. We've all talked about leaving yourself enough time. Lois gave great advice of even taking the time the night before uh, to drive to where you're going, making sure you understand exactly where it is. It's not that other location. It's just up, you know, two blocks up. Uh, because we've all done it. We've all made mistakes. And, you know, again, like I said, people are good. They want you to do your best, but it's it's best to avoid the mistakes if you can, right? Um, but Nashik, if if you know, so we talk about time, but what about managing your time? So you've done all this, you've managed your time, you, you've gotten there early, uh, you're in your car, you're you know you're checking yourself out, making sure that uh, you're looking your best, and then you walk in. But what about managing your time in the actual interview when you want to put your best foot forward? You want to present the you know what you have to bring to them but at the same time they're going to ask you some questions that you're not really sure necessarily H how do you manage your time what advice would you give uh to people how best to manage their time in the actual interview okay um yeah that's a great question um personally something that i would always do is i would and this goes, goes back to you know kind of being prepared um i would always you know google look up you know interview questions right a lot of companies end up using very similar interview questions, you know, a lot of behavioral questions. Now there's always going to be some on the, depending on your position, clinical side, you know, if you're in engineering, something a little bit more tailored, but there's always the general, you know, give us a conflict you have with a coworker, things like that, that you can always look up and find. And, and it's really being prepared. You know, I've had interviews before where I'll ask a question and it, you know, someone's sitting there thinking about it, you know, and you have to, if you have to take a little thought, that's always okay. But if you're spending, you know, 30 seconds thinking of something, um, it does show a little bit of being unprepared. And there's always that kind of what you're saying, the time that kind of comes into play. Um, so like I said, what I would always do is I would always just Google answers um, or questions, really, and kind of prepare in the mirror. You know, I'd talk it out, be like, figure out what my response would be. And, you know, when it came time to the interview, you know, I've, I've always been told sometimes in the interviews that, you know, like, oh, yeah, you know, that was a great quick response. That was a huge thing that they liked. Um, same here. You know, if someone has an answer on the top of their head, it's always great. I know that they're coming in prepared because I know not everyone has these answers on the top of their head. So um, that's what I would personally do and what I always recommend to people. Thank you. And, and Lois, Lois and Megan, do you have an example, also I wanna give a reminder because I just saw Hope uh, put something in the chat, which is a really good reminder. For everyone out there, please send us your crazy questions or send us your uh, things that you want us to ask the panel and we will. Um, but but to, to that point, is there, a, is there a tactful way? We've all seen, we've all watched, uh, right? The classic politicians where they're asked a question. They don't come anywhere near to answering that question, but they oh so gracefully pivot to just say what they wanna say. Is there a way to do that, Lois, uh, Megan? Yeah, um, you know, I, I think what he mentioned earlier was, you know, a lot of our questions, you know, and Lewis added to here, I know that we ask as a network and probably many other employers do as well, are behavioral based questions. You might hear that, right? And so really that what that means is, or our intent in the questions we ask is to figure out 
if you're fit for organization or culture. So sometimes there are roles that we're trying to figure out, you know, do you have the technical skills or do you meet the requirements, the education, the certification, right? But for the most part, we actually really want to learn about you and like your behavioral competencies and characteristics. And if you're going to fit our organization. So we're going to probably ask questions like what he mentioned earlier. Tell me about a time when, right? Give me an example of when. And it might be like, um, you know, what Sean was saying earlier, tell me about a time when you had to deal with, you know, a patient or customer that didn't agree with you or a conflict, right? How did you kind of um, work through that? And when we ask that, you know, an acronym that we've learned and a lot of people kind of share is it's called SAR or STAR, some people call it, but we want to know what was the situation, right? So, so kind of bring us some awareness of what was the situation, you know, where were you working at the time, who was involved, uh, what was your action, right? So what steps did you take um, during, you know, that, that answer, you know, you want to say, here's what I did, here's what happened, and then the result, right, or the outcome. So what ended up happening? Sometimes I think candidates leave that out, right? They'll say, oh, here's the example, and then we're kind of like, we have to keep probing, right? So tell us what ended up happening, and then what did you learn? You know, that's another thing we really like to hear as well is um, if you did have to work through, if you did ask a question about conflict resolution, right? And you gave us an example, what were your learnings through that, right? And so um, SAR, if you can remember anything as far as your answer to those type of questions, think of that, right? Describe the situation for us, describe what you did, and then describe what the outcome was and what you learned. I think that will kind of set you up for how do you prepare pair to kind of answer those questions. Um, and to this point earlier, I think, you know, if we hear some pause a little bit, it tells us, you know, you may not have prepared as much, but I also want to say, I think that's okay at times too. We've all been in interviews. I've been in interviews where we don't necessarily know what they're going to ask. We could prepare as much as we want. We could have answers ready. Um, and, you know, you still get that nervousness, right? I think everyone does. And so we've all been there. We understand. We've been in your shoes. Um, like we said before, we want you to do well, um, but I think it's okay to kind of say, okay, like, let me take a second to think through that. I think that also tells us like you're engaged and you want to provide a good answer because the last thing we want to is for you to just blurt something out. Like Sean was saying earlier, pivot to something different that really didn't ever answer the question we asked originally to. Hopefully that kind of helps a little bit with some tips as well, Sean. Yeah, and I, and I can build on that, Megan. Um, as you said, um, you want to answer the question as well as you can. Absolutely do not make up an answer. If you don't know, if you don't have any experience, it's never happened to you, just say that. Um, you know, I, I really don't have that. I don't, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that question. Or I've never had that experience um, for that. But now what you can do is Sean talked about pivoting because you have prepared some things, you know about the job, you know about you, you might be able to say, I, I really can't answer that question, um, but, I, but then something similar, but I know that one of the things I read about this job is you want someone who's really organized and I'm very organized and give some examples. So you can, you know, if you can think that to pivot, you can do something like that. Um, so it comes back to that preparation, but absolutely do not make up an answer. Just be honest. Well, one thing to follow up on that, um, Lois, um, as well as kind of what she was saying, I, I always recommend and I always tell people, especially high school students, use, you know, examples from school too. You know, if, if you don't oh, have the work experience, um, you know, I always tell people all the time, you know, use something from your personal life. Obviously don't make it anything too, too personal. Um, but again, from classes, um, sports, really, you know, any of that stuff, you can always apply um, to, to some of those questions as well. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Just a clarification question talking about, I love former English teacher here. I love the SAR, the acronym to remind us that we need to make sure that our answers are complete. And it's like writing a research paper, right? You have to make sure you answer the question you start out with trying to answer. But would you say that it would be good? Because we've heard a lot about teamwork today and nothing in the medical field can happen without teamwork. And also for those behavior-based questions, you know, you wanna be able to see the response in a difficult or challenging situation. 
would you say that that's a pretty common expectation that maybe all the students listening could have those and be thinking through those prior to any interview, a challenging situation, and kind of practice the response? Um, I know we, we live in a selfie generation, and so I know that some look in the mirror and talk to themselves more than others. I answer <laughs> myself, but that's okay. Um, but to practice those responses to a challenging situation and then um, an example of when teamwork went well or did not, would mm -hmm. that be a fair practice? Yeah, that's practice. an excellent. Oh, go ahead, jump go ahead. in. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I said absolutely never hurts to prepare and practice. But one of my things on teamwork that I also want to recommend is when I'm interviewing you, I want to hire you, not the team. But I want to know you're a team player. But I want to know what you did. So avoid, unless it truly is, but avoid that. Well. When um, we had a, a class project that had to get done we, as a group, we had to do it. And so we planned and we did, no, I want to know what you did. So we had a class project that we had to uh, get completed by this date and he just had a part. Uh, my part was this and I did this. Or when we had a couple of team members, you know, classmates were fighting. Um, so what I suggest was that why don't we all sit together and talk about, so be clear on when it's appropriate for we to show your team player, but show me as the person who's gonna hire you, what I can look for you to do on my job. Great point, thank you. Yeah, I think, you know, um, what the second panel kind of alluded to, those soft skills, um, I think it was Taryn who was talking a lot about that, right? So I think in any job, um, and especially for high school students as you're, you know, if you're starting work right out of high school, a lot of the jobs, you know, across the board, we're looking for some of those same characteristics, right? We're looking for teamwork and collaboration. Um, we are looking for accountability and reliability. That's a huge one. We need to know that, hey, when, when we're not here, your management team isn't here, like, are you going to show up? Are you going to be on time? Are you going to work your full shift? Um, and then we're really, you know, looking a lot uh, around that work ethic too, right? Um, and so probably a lot of the different employers have questions that are also specific to like their own mission and values and their core values. But I think those soft skills across the board, um, really as far as students preparing themselves for any interview, if you want to Google, you know, like we mentioned before, um, kind of behavioral-based questions and specific to, you know, accountability, reliability, teamwork, communication, you know, to start preparing yourselves, I think that would be super helpful. So we, we, we have just a few minutes left. So just like in a, if we were all in an actual interview right now, this is your opportunity panelists to tell us one thing that you haven't had a chance to tell us yet. Uh, whether it's that one automatic question that you ask in every interview, no matter what it's for, you ask this one question if there's that one magic question for you or anything else that we haven't covered yet. I'll let you three fight over who gets to go first. Um, I will say something real quick um, that I think would be helpful for students to know too is um, in an interview, right, you're, you walk away and you might not always know if you're going to get it or not. And sometimes you'll walk away and you'll know like, wow, I really feel like I did well, right? Or maybe not my best. Um, one, I think what panel two already said was, I think thank you to the hiring manager or the recruiter is super important. But two, I think don't be afraid to ask for feedback, whether you got the job or you did it, right? If you end up especially getting a note that says maybe like, hey, we're, we're moving forward with, you know, some other candidates at this time, that's okay. It's a learning experience. Take it as a learning experience and continue to move forward. But also don't be afraid to reach out to that HR recruiter or that team to say, hey, like, you know, thanks for your response, but hey, any feedback for me on what I can do better next time? Because all of us have been there. All of us have, you know, not received a job opportunity that maybe we went for. But I think to know like why and to kind of have that resonate and then learn for the next time you go through that process and I feel like, you know, in Lewis to see, like, add in if you feel differently or, you know, you want to weigh in here too. But I think it's super helpful to know what can I do better or continue to strengthen as I move forward in interviews. No, yeah, I 100% I agree with that. Um, it, you know, when I was interviewing, 
you know, not all my interviews went perfectly. You know, I was declined positions. You know, I've applied for various things, you know, especially right out of college that I would get declined for. And yeah, just sometimes it would just be the not knowing like what it was because I would want to improve on that. So I would reach out and just be like, hey, just out of curiosity, what was the um, thing? Sometimes it was, you know, out of my control. Sometimes it would be like some questions. Maybe I wasn't experienced enough, things like that. But it's great to know you get that feedback uh, 100%. Um, for me, one advice I will give that I think we haven't discussed yet is um, be careful when you're going in your experiences and not bad mouthing um, previous employers or just in a general situation, other team members, you know, you want to make a statement of, you know, if you're explaining why you left something, it's one thing, but you want to be very careful not to talk bad about previous employers that can kind of play into us seeing, well, if you ever left us, you know, you would maybe talk bad. So be careful with that. I do run into that with people. Um, so be very careful when you're explaining a bad situation, how you're going about that. Okay, Lois, you have the final 30 seconds, Lois, it's yours. Okay, um, well then my final would be two, one, even in this COVID times, have a firm handshake. Nothing worse than a noodle handshake um, at beginning and end. Let the interviewer lead whether they're gonna shake hands with COVID, but other than that, and then just be prepared. Be yourself, smile, uh, be confident, look people in the eye, and um, try to just convey who you are and they and we as interviewers will get that. Thank you so much, Lois, Megan, Ashik. Thank you so much. Uh, Amanda, thank you for being my co-moderator. Uh, it's, it's, it was great to be with you all today. And now we're gonna uh, pass it back to Rita. To close us out today. Thank you. Wow, I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm like Sean, I've learned a lot today. I've learned a lot from this event. I don't know if I'm ready to go into healthcare just yet because I enjoy my job too much here as tech prep director. But but anyway, but I I, I want to say kudos and thank you to all the panelists today, all the moderators. I know you guys have met before this and and have really done a great job in coordinating all the conversation and keeping up with our chat that made my job easy today. Um, we also would love to hear your feedback. And I, Helena, I think she's going to post a survey um a survey link in in the chat we're also going to mail this survey link out to everybody because we're hoping to get your feedback this is important to us because we want to know as as an audience here what do we need to make sure that we get back to you we've got a couple more success bounds coming up and this is going to help us in future events so um if helena hasn't already i think she will post that in our chat again it, there it is. She's got it there. And then also Terry Bennett has also posted our tech prep website. We've had a little issues with our server. So be patient if you get on and and have issues with um, with it not working. But we're in the process. We've got people working on that. So hopefully that will not be a problem, so, you know, in the future. But we do have two success bounds I do want to mention. We have one next week, actually May 18th. And it's from one to three and it's on the manufacturing side. So even if you're in healthcare or you're interested in, in looking at different opportunities and kind of seeing what happens on the manufacturing side, this is an opportunity for you to join us. We actually have Mitsubishi Electric that's gonna be presenting and AstraZeneca, which again is a straight alignment with the healthcare. And, and um, we've had them on before and they have some great stories to tell us, but. That is one that we're having on next Tuesday, and the link will be on our website, which is the techprepsouthwestohio.org. And then we also have one on May 18th or June 1st. And June 1st, as mentioned in this presentation, Forest Hills has done an excellent job with some of their experience ships with getting students jobs while they're in high school out in the in the professions. And then also building these successful partnerships with the community and their connections. So they're going to share some experience. There's some experience from their students on, on what this has helped them and how this has helped them with their future, um, future pathways after graduation. So again, thank you all. This has been a great event. I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I have learned so much. I hope you all have learned a lot from this. And hopefully we'll stay connected. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to, 
to me or Hope or the tech prep team. And if we don't have the answers, we can actually get you some direction there. So again, thank you all. I appreciate everything that's everybody is involved in, in putting this all together and also um, all that all that's participated. You guys have a great Wednesday. Enjoy your 